begin the program in a minute hey everyone on behalf of the west bengal national university of judicial sciences it is an absolute honor and privilege to welcome you all to the professor n r madhavan menon legal conclave 2020 i would request our esteemed panelists to kindly come on stage professor mizanur rahman from the dhaka university जस्टिस अनिरुद्ध बोस फ्रॉम द सुप्रीम कोर्ट जस्टिस संजीव बैनर्जी फ्रॉम द कैलकटा हाई हाई कोर्ट एंड ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर ऑफ एनयू जेस डॉक्टर चौकपति I would like to call upon our honourable Vice Chancellor, Professor Chakravarti, to felicitate Professor Mizanur Rahman from the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. I would now request honourable Vice Chancellor, Professor Chakravarti. Now I would like to call upon. constitutionalism in legal education emerging issues and challenges without further ado i would now like to invite our honorable vice chancellor professor dr n k chokrabarti to deliver the welcome address very good morning to all of you and welcome 
to Professor Rainer Madhavamena on legal conclave on grounding constitutionalism in legal education. We are, as our students already told you that background, why we have observed this conclave because of factors which make Professor Menon a father of legal education in India. And to commemorate that, we have decided to organize this conclave today and tomorrow both. On behalf of West Bengal National Law University, Juridical Science, and on my personal behalf, Judge Calcutta High Court, Professor Mijanur Rahman from Dhaka, of the dais, distinguished guest, distinguished speakers all over the country, our invited guests, my colleagues and my dear students. Welcome to this first edition of Professor Enar Madhavamenam Legal Conclave, focusing on grounding constitutionalism in legal education. Allow me to begin with the concept and concern of legal education of Professor Menon, which just almost two years back we came across from his writings, which was distributed in the workshop on skill learning in legal education on 4th March 2018. He raised some issues to legal education in India today. He asked, is our curriculum dominated by doctrinal organization? Do our teaching method promotes note memorization? Are we encouraging students to be superficial, authoritarian, class-minded, and immoral? Is our pedagogy taking into account individual learning styles and capacities? Are we preparing our graduates practice ready in the diverse areas of professions like transnational awards in corporate law firms, in-house councils in private sectors, community lawyering in rural India, litigation practice in trial and appellate courts, judicial and civil services, teaching and research, or specialized problem-solving skills needed in family courts, juvenile justice boards, local law, drama laws, commercial courts, green tribunals, arbitration and mediation practice. His perception that we get from his writings, giving much attention to make the students practice daily and also to impart justice education. To make them practice daily, he quote, quoted McCarty's reports on resettlement of legal education of Jonathan Rose. He wrote, I quote, since Christopher Columbus Langdell said it course, legal education has evolved to meet changing needs and visions and has changed significantly over time. Its objectives have been multiple or even ambiguous has been the extent to which it should focus on a skill necessary for law practice. Almost same concern <coughs> we get from his writings almost 20 years back in his book, 
Clínica Médica de Lurisa. He also looked into the law as naturally conceived in broad perspective of several instruments of social control to be understood in relation to other social institutions and processes. The lawyer is not to be mere craftsman manipulating advocacy in traditional role conflict resolution in course. There are other concurrent curricular and goals for legal education also, some of which may be more important than litigation in the context of our society. The inclusion of subjects as it prescribed in the book, law and poverty or law and social change, which is now one of the subjects in Bar Council prescribed curriculum, expects the future lawyers to be equipped for policy making and advisory role. Therefore, in grounding constitutionalism, in legal education, on the above thoughts of Professor Menon, we may connect two most important articles of Directive Principles of State Policy of our Constitution, Article 38, Clause 2, and Article 39. These two articles says, Article 39A has been inserted to enjoin the state to provide free legal aid the poor and to take other suitable steps to ensure equal justice to all, which is offered by our preamble. By inserting clause 2 in Article 38 by 44th Amendment in 1978, also says the state shall, in particular, strive to minimize the inequalities in income and endeavor to eliminate inequalities in status, facilities and opportunities not only amongst individuals but also amongst groups of people residing in different areas or engaged in different vocations. The legal profession in India today offers great challenges and great opportunities. It is a profession that has had a long-standing active role in the social, political and economic life of the country and it has the potential for even greater or more positive influence in the future. For legal education to be more responsive to the current deficiencies in legal profession, law students must be provided with at least a basic level of professional skills and a basic understanding of foundation of professional responsibility in the social context. With this end in view, with the students and faculty members of West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences decided to pay our homage to Professor Menon by looking into the teaching and learning Indian constitution through challenges of today's legal education, focusing on constitutional values, particularly justice to people. And that's why our focal themes not only on constitutional aspects in legal education but also how it can be connected with our families, the gender justice, also the contemporary issues of other socio-legal problems which we will discuss today and tomorrow in various sessions. I welcome you all again for this today's law conclave and hope you will enjoy it and we will after the conference, definitely produce a document made in the book, form of a book, which will record or concern in the process which Professor Benham thought of legal education. Thank you again. Welcome to this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Received the Best Law Teacher in South Asia Award in 2010. He is also the visiting professor at Umeå University, Sweden, and University of Oslo, Norway. He is also the founder coordinator of professional legal education in Bangladesh. He is acclaimed as one of the best human rights educationists in the country by advocates participants of the Human Rights Training Program for Lawyers. 
Experienced in institutional building, he was a formal consultant to UNICEF, ILO, UNDP, the World Bank, and also the national consultant to government of Bangladesh, among other things. We are pleased to have you with us, sir. We would now like to invite you to deliver the inaugural address. The Honorable Vice Chancellor of this University, Professor A. K. Chakraborty Sahib, Your Excellences, Mr. Justice Sanjeev Banerjee, Mr. Justice Anirudh Abos, esteemed colleagues, ladies, gentlemen, and my great students of law. As I stand before this August gathering, I feel extremely humbled. I am at the same time engulfed by a hard to explain emotion to be standing under the roof of an edifice whose every single brick echoes the name of a person I am here to pay tribute to, Professor Nilakanta Ramakrishna Madhavadanan, the architect of modern legal education in India and the subcontinent. I did not have the good fortune of being his classroom student, but I dare say I was his student and continue to be his disciple. It could not have been otherwise, since anyone coming in contact with his great legal mind, even for a negligible span of time, had never returned back empty-handed. More than that, the return was always manifold, times bigger, even if this realization had come long after he had left his company. In the words of Tagore, <laughs> Thou hast made me endless, such is thy pleasure. This frail vessel thou emptiest again and again, and fillest it ever with fresh life. Let me honestly confess today that had there not been the political and territorial division between India and Bangladesh, had not been the elements of state sovereignty so cruel, rough and ruthless, I would have never parted with this man as a disciple and a people. I would have positioned myself at his feet, always prepared to drink the elixir of wisdom flowing continuously from this inextinguishable source of inspiration to explore the unknown. As I reminisce about my guru, I have to go back to July 1989, when I got the first glimpse of this great man. My visit to Bangalore was sponsored by the Asia Foundation. My task was to see and get a first-hand experience of the recently begun experiment with legal education conducted by Professor Menon through a mechanism we today call the National Law School Model. I consented to go for the mission primarily because of two reasons. Firstly, the way the Asia Foundation talked about Professor Menon aroused in me a keen interest to see, talk, and know the person. And secondly, I was introduced to do so through the system of modern education, including legal education and training. The air was full with the disbelief in the capacity of native minds to challenge the status quo and mastermind fundamental progressive changes. My personal factor also had a role in my associating with this scheme. I had my basic legal education in a socialist country, strive to become a serious student of historical materialism and given the existing ideology-based distinction in development models found it rather queer that Western organizations were so appreciative of the homegrown Bangalore experiment. On the assigned day, the director of NSIU Bangalore, Professor Madhava Menon, provided his ambassador card to drive me from the guest house to the administrative building. I was seated at the registrar's office and was given a few brochures and pamphlets describing the NLS. I was going through those. Suddenly, a man entered the room, handed over to the registrar, 
a few files with instructions regarding what to do next and left with the words. And I quote, when Dr. Rahman from Bangladesh comes, bring him in, unquote. By the time I could infer that he is the man I came to see, he was already gone. I exclaimed, so that's him, Professor Miller. The registrar thought it redundant to respond to my, uh, respond and politely asked me to follow him. And thus, I was led to the director's room, furnished very simply, nothing compared to the luxurious office of the chairman of the Department of Law of the university I came from. What a contrast. However, the first greetings came from Professor Menon. So, you are Dr. Rahman from the Dhaka University. Sorry, they didn't recognize you. I handed him my name card. It was only later in life I understood that real personalities do not require any name card. And said, Sir, my name is Mizanur Rahman, but you can call me Mizan. I can't explain what prompted me to do so, but from that moment till his last day on earth, I was his Mizan. No Dr. Mizan, no Professor Rahman, only Mizan. After this brief introduction, the first question I asked him was, Well, sir, you are the director, I mean, the vice chancellor of this university. How come you carry the files to the room of your subordinates? Don't you have messengers, these chopracies of peons to help you? With his usual sweet and innocent smile, Professor Menon replied, How much time would that have wasted, Nizam? Moreover, it's just a next door on the same floor. Don't you think it's a more efficient way to do the work? I had no answer. But I had no doubt whatsoever that I was with the person I was longing to see and be with all my life. The tour started from the library. As we moved from shelf to shelf, he continued sharing his thoughts on contemporary legal scholarship, necessity of law journals, law reviews, contributed and edited by students, commentaries, and law reporters. After a working lunch, I asked Professor Vinan whether I could sit in a classroom during any session. A class routine was on his table, and placing it before me, he asked which class of classes I would be interested to attend. I chose two classes, one on public international law and the other on constitutional law of India. I was waiting for Professor Menon to ask one of his staff to guide me to the classroom, and again, I proved myself wrong. Professor Menon himself accompanied me to the class on constitutional law. The class had already begun. Very swiftly, he opened the door we entered, he excused himself, and briefly introduced me, adding that I wanted to attend the class, and then he left as quietly as he had entered. I made myself comfortable at a back seat, but now, as I looked straight, I was thunderstruck to see two lecturers on the stage. Initially, one lecturer talked for about 10 minutes, and then the second lecture I took over and mentioned some arguments almost contrary to what the first speaker had said. I felt a kind of movement among the students. Many hands were raised, interesting questions asked, and both the lecturers responded following their own line of thoughts and arguments. It was such a unique experience that it took me quite some time to understand the method itself. I was so absorbed in the discussion that I totally forgot about the international law class. And when the bell rang, I gained the courage to push myself into Professor Menon's room. I was very straightforward and blunt. Son, isn't this madness? Aren't you confusing your students? His special expression told me that he was expecting this question from me and calmly replied, on the contrary, Mizan, this is what we call cooperative or collaborative learning and teaching. Isn't it better 
that the learners are exposed to different, even conflicting ideas of thought on one and the same issue at an early stage, then they can put their mind and find out the truth for himself, for his time, and for his society. Having come in from a background where teachers are believed to be the reservoir of all knowledge, where it is only the teacher who knows the whole truth, the madness of cooperative teaching was directed to crushing the monopoly of the authority of the teacher. It was not merely madness, but for me it sounded revolutionary and it was love at first sight. There were more surprises in store for me. Even before I could recover from my initial shock from what I had witnessed a while back, Professor Menon handed over to me a memorabilia of an LSI. It was a pretty wooden stand with inscribed verses from Gitanjali. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth into that haven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. As I was looking at the memorabilia and wondering how our love for Tagore had found its rightful place there, Professor Menon said, Mizan, this is what we believe in. This is our motto. Did I require any more reason to fall in love with this man? As we parted, Professor Menon asked me to join him over a cup of tea at the director's residence in the evening. Back at the guest house, I opened my notebook and tried to go through the points I had jotted down during the previous few hours at the NLSI. It was not difficult to comprehend that the approach to legal education was quite modern and scientific, method was interactive and clinical, and quality control measures were integrated with the teaching modules. However, I was still not very convinced that this was a model to be highly appreciative of. It is still, in my opinion, fell short of being named as something innovative in nature. Well, a distinct university dedicated solely to legal education was of course an innovative idea, but, did, but didn't that have more to do with the form rather than the content of legal education? During our previous conversations, Professor Mayden had described why he opted for a five years integrated undergraduate course, made it multidisciplinary and decided to confer BA LLB degree. This was nothing new for me. In the socialist countries, law was always considered to be a humanizing discipline and hence legal education was complemented and supplemented by instructions of literature, economics, history, geography, sociology and philosophy. I myself was a product of that school. As such, I found nothing new in the Bangalore model. It is only later that I came to realize how little did I know of the madness in the method of Professor Menon. A whole new world was unveiled for me during our conversation at the evening tea. We were seated under the open sky. The daylight was surrendering to the intruding Every darkness. Birds and flocks were returning to their habitats. A serene silence and calmness engulfed the surroundings, but Professor Menon's eyes were glowing with brightness. As I summed up my impression for the day and argued whether his model puts more emphasis on forms rather than on contents, Professor Menon, in his characteristic sober manner, introduced to me his thoughts on community law reform project, a mandatory part of the NLSIU curriculum, wherein students have to conduct research on marginalized communities and come up with suggestions for legislative reforms to ameliorate the sufferings. I felt a jolt in me. Legal education for social justice. 
Isn't this I have been looking for since I began my career as a law teacher? Isn't it this that was missing from our traditional legal education? Isn't this what makes legal education socially relevant? Isn't this what made Professor Menon surpass all others engaged in legal education? Isn't this the real innovation in legal education? By the time we finished our evening tea, I knew I was reborn. And the man who just instilled new life in me was Professor Enar Madhavmedan, my teacher, guide, and philosopher. My trip to Bangalore could not have been more rewarding. I bade Professor Menon goodbye. But little did I know that it was just the beginning of a relationship that would last for almost three decades till he breathed his last in 2019. On an invitation from Bangladesh Law Teachers Association, Professor Menon visited Bangladesh in early 1990 to conduct a workshop on clinical legal education. The two-day workshop was held in the seminar room of the Institute of Engineers, Bangladesh, and participated by law teachers and practitioners from around the country. I happened to be the youngest member in the workshop. When Professor Menon, assisted by Professor N. L. Mitra of NLSI, talked about problem-solving methods of teaching, I garnered enough courage to show him questions on public international law prepared by me for my students at the University of Dhaka. Professor Menon was almost taken by surprise, praised highly the question papers, and requested that he be given a set of question papers to test his students back home at Bangalore. On many subsequent occasions, Professor Menon would never cease to mention how those question papers had left a permanent impression in his mind. This, however, was the beginning of numerous trips he would subsequently make to Bangladesh, the last one being in May 2018, when he delivered the A.K. Khan Memorial Law Lecture at the University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. For some reasons unknown, Professor Menem requested the organizers that he would very much like to see me at the lecture. This led me to be invited to Chittagong. I flew on the morning of the lecture and drove straight to the venue from the airport. However, during the journey, I was told that a mishap had happened. Professor Menon arrived on the night before, but his luggage did not. He duly made a complaint to the jet airways, the line that he flew with, and took the domestic flight to Chittagong. He was very upset since all his clothes, shaving kids, etc., were in the checked in luggage. He reached quite late at Chittagong, and all the shops were closed. The dean of the faculty took him to a market requested the shopkeeper to do a favor and managed to purchase undergarments, a sky blue full sleeve shirt and other necessary toiletries. By the time I reached the lecture room, Benu, all the dignitaries, including Professor Bennett, were already seated on the stage. As I walked into the hall, I saw a chair lying back and next to Professor Menon. Professor Menon embraced me. I touched his feet, took my seat next to him and whispered, Sarah, you look so elegant. Blue color suits you so well. Professor Menon responded with his usual heavenly smile, took my left hand and pressed it gently. In his speech, Professor Menon talked about the rule of law as an unqualified human good and of legal education as a public good. In his words, unlike other types of higher education, education in law is more of a public good than a private good. This is because of the interest of societies in democracy, human rights, and good governance, for which there is no better instrument than a rule of law. In his deliberations, Professor Menon was more candid than ever. He posed the question, how long can the legal profession remain a private monopoly with large sections of people denied access to justice? Lawyers for individual clients under the conventional adversary system has to undergo structural changes if the profession has to fulfill the new role as change agents for social change and social justice. However, I will just quit a part of my written speech 
and uh, because of the time constraints, I'll just go to the, you know, the next section. Menon, the man for all seasons. Uh, another remarkable trait of Professor Menon's character was his pragmatic approach to diverse and complex problems of life. He knew best how to cut the coat according to cloth. I remember an incident that took place in Miami, USA, in 1996. I was attending the American Association of Law Schools Conference. I was the lone participant from Bangladesh. The Indian delegation comprised Professor Menon, Professor Balra Chauhan, the teacher at the Lucknow University, and two young law teachers from Delhi University, Professor Poonam Saxena and Professor Beth Kumar. In our first meeting, we named ourselves the South Asian delegation and requested Professor Menon to be our head. The conference was participated by hundreds of delegates from all, almost all the US law schools, as well as delegations from other continents. I can still vividly remember one of the sessions participated by the law school deans. There were six deans representing the US law schools seated on the stage. The only alien face was that of Professor Menon's. The US deans took turns to talk about various challenges faced by them in modernizing legal education and complained about shortage or lack of adequate funds to effect changes. What was interesting is that they all had several hundred thousand to millions of dollars at their disposal, yet they were complaining of inadequacy of funds. Professor Menon was the last speaker in the session. He rose, went to the podium, and pronounced the first sentence. You have millions and still complaining of inadequacy of funds. Give me just a fraction of what you have, and I promise to do miracles. The audience went mad with applause. Then he narrated the Bangalore experiences. I was sitting almost at the back. His speech caused something like a commotion in the audience, and I found some deans uttered in exclamation, Hey, this man talks sense. We must see him later. <coughs> Professor Menon had already made solutions to any problem the lawyers who might face. This brings me to another incident, witness to which I was in 2018, while he was visiting the University of Chicago. As the lunch was prepared, Professor Menon suggested that we take a round of the newly constructed state-of-the-art complex of the law faculty. The young dean volunteered to guide us. Professor Menon took my hand. During later years of his life, whenever we met, he used to hold me by the hand, and his touch was abnormally soft. In my experience, the only other person whose hands were as soft were those of Nelson Mandela. And we started walking through the corridors, inside the classrooms, the library, teachers' rooms, etc. The architecture of the building is such that there is a round space in the middle of the edifice. A lone tree was standing there, and one could guess that the place was not taken well care of. Professor Mayer commented, sliding his head towards the dean, it could have been a nice garden here, and you could have also planted various medical and herbal plantations. The dean replied that despite his repeated attempts, he failed to secure a position of a Mali or a gardener for the faculty, and hence the surrounding is in such a dilapidated condition. Professor Menon was prompt to his response. Don't you have any course on environmental law? Yes, sir, we do have. Why don't you then make a project? that environmental law students will have to take care of the garden and the plants. For this, you don't need any gardener or money. If you visit the Chittagong University Law Faculty today, you'll be pleased to see Professor Menon smiling through the flowers and the plants in a well-kept garden. Go there any season, and Professor Menon is ever vigilant there to greet you with all his humility and grace. But then now I'll be talking about my last encounter, the last part of my speech. When Professor Menon was the Vice Chancellor of the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, I was in full swing through my experience, experiments with anti-generic learning and rebellious lawyering in Bangladesh. One very important segment of the experiment is the Human Rights Summer School, a two-week-long residential course on human rights training and advocacy. I must confess that my experiment was nothing more than expanding the thoughts and ideas of Professor Menon to make legal education socially relevant. I invited him to come and interact with my students in Bangladesh. He replied immediately whether he could come with a group of students. We were delighted to welcome a group of six students from NUJS led by him and another faculty. 
Subsequently, students from Nepal, Pakistan, Iran, and other countries began participating in the program, making it a truly international school. 2019 was the 20th year of the HRSS experiment. I happened to attend the Commonwealth Legal Education Association conference held at the Modi University, Rajasthan, India, in 2018. We had already decided that Professor Menon would grace the 20th anniversary celebrations as the chief guest. The theme of the HRSS were already decided human rights and rebellious lawyer. After the opening plenary, Professor Menon returned to the hotel while we stayed at the venue the whole day. I asked Professor Siva Kumar of Indian Royal Institute when would be the right time to see with Professor Menon. He informed that Professor Menon would be leaving early next morning and therefore if I had told him to see him, it has to be that night. It was already late and I immediately returned to the hotel. I hesitated to knock on his door. Should I disturb him at this late hour? And if he has already fallen asleep, my wife gave me courage. Sir loves you very much. I am sure he won't mind. I approached his door, rang the bell once, and was waiting to see what happens next. Without much delay, the door opened and I was amazed to see a white angel standing in front of me. Dressed in all white, white Kerala Nungi and white half sleeves vest, it was Professor Menon inviting me to get inside. I apologized for disturbing him so late at night, but he patted on my shoulders and retorted that he also wished to talk to me. I told him, sir, it's 20th year of the HRSS next year. You must come, sir. Already 20 years. Well, Mizan, time passes so fast. You know, Mizan, that we belong to the same school. I am happy that you are trying to make our experiment farther from where I had left it. I never dreamt that the national law school products would cater to the corporate world. But unfortunately, that's what I witnessed today. Maybe I have failed in my mission. But we must not fail. Maybe your rebellious lawyering is the correct approach. I replied back, but sir, nothing is complete without you. Please promise that you will come at the 20th HRSS. At this, Professor Menon looked at me with his usual smile and said, Well, Vizan, you see, I am already an old man. I don't know whether I will live that long. But if I am well, I will definitely attend the 20th HRSS. I touched his feet, he embraced me, and I left towards my room. Did I have any idea then that it would be my last encounter with my guru, Professor Madhava Menon? Professor Menon was a complete man. I am yet to see another teacher so unpretentious, so down to earth, and so versatile, yet with such unfathomable humility. Here was a man with so distinct South Indian accent, but he never attempted to hide or camouflage his Indianness. Whenever he spoke, all eyes were glued to him, and he was destined to be, albeit unwillingly, the central figure in the gathering. And he always talked sense. Sometimes I wonder where and how did he learn to use the appropriate words. He could listen to him for hours together, and he still not feel tired or bored. He was born as a teacher, lived the life of a teacher, and at the end died as a teacher. Otherwise, how can one contemplate the way the final hours of his life on this planet unfolded? This brings me to the celebrations of the Law Teachers Day 2019. This was a befitting tribute to Professor Menon. The stage was set in the coastal town of Kovala with its serene beauty all around. The calm atmosphere was a reminder to the calmness of the legendary teacher of law to whose memory the day was dedicated. I flew from Bangladesh to be part of an era whose curtains were being closed there. But how little did I know what greater surprise was awaiting us all. During all these years, we thought that we knew Professor Menon. But did we? Really? The 
ceremony was attended by dignitaries and legal luminaries, including former colleagues and students of Professor Menon. They came not only from the different parts of India, but from afar, from different continents, to pay their tributes to their teacher for one last time. Everyone was reminiscing about the departed soul, one after another, and then came on to the podium, a short but a strongly built man, and narrated about the final hours of Professor Menon in this life. The story goes like this. The night before Professor Menon was taken to the hospital and put on life support, he had his supper earlier than usual, switched off the lights and went to bed. At about midnight, he woke up, switched the lights on, slowly walked to his study table, sat on a chair, took a piece of paper and scribbled something. Then he slid the paper into an envelope wrote an address on it, closed it, put out the lights, and went back to sleep. He was driven to the hospital the next morning and never to come back alive. After all the post-mortem rituals were completed, Mrs. Menon found the envelope lying on the study table of her deceased husband. On the envelope was written, some so-so nigh principal Kerala Law Academy. Mrs. Menon who all through her conjugal life had never failed to be at a course distance from her husband, had always shared the joys and sorrows of life with her husband, thought it as a last testament of Professor Menon that she doesn't fail to deliver the letter to the accuracy. And with due diligence, she arranged that the letter reaches Mr. Nair. Upon receiving the letter, Mr. Nair became obsessed with both joy, suspense, and fear for the unknown. He instinctively opens the envelope and finds that the only words that Professor Menon had written him on that piece of paper was, and I quote, Nair, what what is legal education if it cannot ensure access of the poor to justice? Unquote. These were the last words expressed by my guru in this life. Don't these words epitaphize all that Professor Menon stood for, strived for all his life, wanted all of us to join hands and accomplish his mission? Professor Menon has done his part of the job, but the job is yet to be fulfilled. He has worked long miles, but we know that there are still miles to go before we call it the day. Are we prepared and we to walk the walk. Dear sir, in your last email, you addressed me as Brother Mizan. But sir, I prefer to remain your student, ever willing to learn all that is there to take from me. And even if mine is an old voice, sir, let me shout to the top of my voice, come what may, dear sir, your Mizan is here to carry on the pious missionary journey that you had begun. Despite frustrations and betrayals at times, you know, sir, you were blessed with more friends than foes. And there are people whose hearts you have kindled and ignited and who will never tire to carry forward your idea of legal education to serve the poor. Yes, sir, we have miles to go before we sleep. Thank you very much. Appropriate and intellectual property law. Justice Banerjee was eliminated to the bench of the High Court at Calcutta in 2006. Now, without further ado, I would request Sanjeev the Hunter, Justice Banerjee to deliver his address. Thank you. Justice Bose, brothers, retired Justice Sashim Rai, Justice Shomin Sen, Professor Rehman, Professor Chakravarti, respected members of the faculty, beloved students, ladies and gentlemen. After that wonderful insight into the life of Professor Madhav Menon, I will be short and share only a few experiences. The profile which was read out probably from the High Court website referred to my having done my law from Calcutta University. 
Unfortunately, there was hardly a class that had to be attended at that point of time. Indeed, when I took the examination, the preliminary examination, I found that there was an agitation going at the entrance. The exam was to start at 12 noon. It was around about 11 o'clock. The gates were closed and people couldn't, students couldn't get in, candidates couldn't get in. But after some time I noticed that the first floor and the second floor started filling up because we could see the balcony from downstairs. And then I realized that desperate students were using the pipe on the side of the Banga building to climb to the first floor. And that's exactly how I climbed to the first floor to take my preliminary examinations in law without having attended a class because there were no classes. Why I say this is because most of you should be grateful that you go through an education system where you come to learn, you're taught and you have an organized teaching scheme. There was a period of anarchy in the education system in the state, particularly legal education, where we do not know how we passed or why we passed. We do not know how we were assessed, but we learned every bit of law after obtaining our certificate and coming to court. I get a stream of interns from law colleges all over the country and most of you are so much smarter than we were when we were at your level or at your stage. Because in interpreting, if you are aware of the history or the circumstances that led to why that law was laid down, it becomes much easier, it becomes much easier in implementing the law. In our country, post-independence, we had a rather elitist legal system manned by principally judges from elitist backgrounds and well-to-do families. In the process of churning that took place from the middle of the 1980s, there was something else which was introduced and which we are lacking once again. There were four judges of the Supreme Court, commonly known in academic circles as the four musketeers, Justices Bhagwati, Between them, one of them was the architect of the epistolary jurisdiction which is now known as public interest litigation and has been much maligned as PESA interest litigation in recent times. Another who went to the Supreme Court very late in life turned certain concepts on their heads based on his very apt understanding of the social milieu and the mores of the times. And the two others, we are told, sat together on many an evening, many an evening, and they had a galaxy of, or they had a few, academic minds which discuss the problems and kind of molded the minds of these judges into a direction and into a system that was not present there to before. Indeed, as you are all aware, our judicial system had failed the country at its darkest hour and which is why we remember Justice Khanna more than anybody else for his 
most important descent. We now have a National Judicial Academy in Bhopal. I've had the privilege of being there on several occasions. Professor Menon used to be quite a regular during the period that I was a regular over there. And there were several evenings spent with personalities like Justice S. B. Sina, Justice Ravindran, Professor Madhav Menon and Professor Mohan Gopal, who was then the director and a disciple of Professor Madhav Menon. And sometimes these discussions went till 2 or 3 in the morning on how do we improve the system, on legal education, and many other spheres. And I am indebted to those discussions because my knowledge and my area of operation were quite limited before I became a judge. I congratulate all of you and the NUJS in having this conclave. What we must endeavor is to have serious academic criticism of judgments delivered by Indian courts. <coughs> Indeed, that is an area that is lacking. When the Law Quarterly Review is published in Harvard, I'm told many a Supreme Court judge spends a sleepless night the previous night because they don't know how the criticism of their judgments are going to be. We lack a body of academics to realize, to really criticize our judgments and by criticism it doesn't mean scandalous criticism, it means constructive criticism. Because sometimes judges can be very lonely and in a sense cut off from the realities of the day-to-day -day life. I thank Professor Chakraborty and the faculty for having me here. Continue your good work and I hope to be among you as often as I am called. God bless you. Namaste. Thank you, sir. I would now like to call upon our next name. On the day and Justice Shane, Justice Roy, of the days, <coughs> Professor Rama, Professor Chakraborty, the Vice Chancellor. Well, uh, I will start from where Professor Menon left. What is his legacy today? All of you have heard he has changed the concept of legal education. Brother Banerjee gave a picture of what legal education was and we know what legal education is today. It's, I have come across uh, students who given up uh, IIT joint entrance or the medical admission test to opt for law as a career. Now there are about 25 law schools and 1200 law colleges in India. So a large number of lawyers are entering the profession every year. What does one do? I personally have interacted with Professor Medan when he was here. Then 
when he took over National Judicial Academy at Bhopal. And my last meeting was last December, few months before his departure in Rachi, in the law university there. <coughs> From his 25 people of the law schools, many of the students are joining law firms or industry. From traditionalists, it's not what is meant to be because in public perception, a lawyer is one who dons the robe and screams at the court. They are the artillery and infantry, infantry man of the war. Whereas those in offices are meant to be in charge of the ordnance factories. But Professor Menon, he narrated a story, not a story, a real a factual situation. Around that time, there's a big controversy going on between the Indian government and the power company. And Indian government was on the verge of losing the legal battle, which was taking shape in the form of an arbitration. Fortunately, that company eventually got wound up. <coughs> so, Professor Menon, he knew many people and things. He told me, do you know why it happened like that? The negotiating team of that power company had 25 lawyers. And from the Indian side, there were 25 officials. So, law is necessary at every level. And I think it's not a very, like when we were studying, I think I was paying per month 19 rupees or something like that. That was the fee of the college I went to. And most of the law universities are costing around between 1 lakh to 1 or 2 lakh to 10 lakhs a year. After five years there, if you tell the student that you must learn for five years before you earn anything, that's not a very ideal situation. So, law firm is a necessity and I personally find nothing wrong. Because today's industry needs lawyers everywhere. If the legal community or legal profession fails to supply to those slots, some other profession will fill in the blanks. Next is what does one do? Now There was an Irish judge in the 19th century, Sir James Matthew. He said, yes, yes, the justice system in England is open to all, like Reed's Hotel. Whoever wants can get in. We are in a apparent irony or dilemma, but in reality it's necessity. We are at the same time trying to reduce litigations and also through access of justice program increase the number. <coughs> we are creating new laws which are requiring new courts and parallelly we are moving ahead with ADR, etc. So, there are around 17,000 judges in India in total 
and uh, I think that the last has been in the And three crore pending cases. <coughs> now, I don't know. Even with 17,000 judges, how long did it take to clear the backlog? But in reality, many of these cases can be resolved through ADR mechanism, and a lot of them are actually infructuous. My suggestion to the students would be you will have to some kind of uh, formula you will have to evolve where pro bono work can supplement the earning work and as this is Bannerji said, law profession has come out of that traditional legal family closed shop and it's much more open now. So the scope is enormous and I see also a new trend that some law students, they are combining and setting up litigation practice together. That's a new model and possibly a good model to follow because one has to maintain an office and fortunately one doesn't, for, or unfortunately one doesn't need much books now, one laptop and one connection to one of these uh, law software can take care of the library. Now, I don't lend in my advices. All of you are very able and competent. The only thing I'll say is that brilliance in law has its own role. Now, I'm saying this because when you are entering the law schools, you are much beyond the average grade. But in legal profession, hard work <coughs> has no substitute. I have seen many brilliant students being unsuccessful in law, but I have not seen a single hard working lawyer unsuccessful. Thank you.